In this video, I'm going to be working on a standard bike, one of my Honda ST1100 V4s that I use every day as my daily commute. I've had the green one for over 20 years, and it's getting a bit loose around the edges now, so I bought myself a new to me red one, year 2000. It's got a very slight engine noise that I'm not happy with, so I decided to take the whole bike apart, find out what the problem is, and repair it. I've had my green ST1100 for over 20 years. It's had a really hard life and done lots of miles. And my friend offered me this red one that's only done 17,000 miles, so I snapped it up. But after riding it for a little while, I noticed this slight engine knock that I never had before on my green bike. I thought, I can't live with this. I need to strip the whole bike down, find out what the problem is, and repair it. So first of all, I had to remove all the bodywork. There's so much of it. And when it's removed from the bike, it takes up so much room. With the bodywork removed, I drained out the oil and removed the sump, and that was mint really clean. When I looked up inside the engine from underneath that was also really clean. So then I removed the clutch and that turned out to be perfect condition as well which is what I'd expect for 17,000 miles but I was getting a predominant knock so I had to go further. So I thought right that's it the engine's got to come out and I'm going to strip it right down to find the problem. So the next thing I removed the carburetors and put them on the bench out of the way. As soon as the carburetors were removed I stuffed some clean tissue down the inlet ports to protect them and then I can drain out the coolant. It takes a while to fully drain, but once it's drained, I can replace the drain plug. The horn has to be removed to get the radiator off, so I loosen the single mounting bolt and take that away from the bike. Then I need to loosen these two top bolts on the radiator and these two hoses, one at the bottom and one at the top. So first of all, I loosen the two top bolts. The last thing I need to do is disconnect the electrical feed to the fan and this just simply pulls out. Then the radiator can be gently lifted away from the front of the bike. With the radiator out of the way, I can see in past where the clutch used to be and you can see the bottom of the crankshaft. In fact, you can see the first big end for cylinder number one. And when I move a screwdriver in there, I can actually wiggle it about and see some play, which is a bit unusual. I wasn't expecting to feel any play at all, but I did. The next thing to remove is the lower frame rail on the left hand side. This is bolted in place in three places with two sets of bolts. So I loosen those off in my socket set and that just lifts away. I place all the engine retaining bolts and brackets into a metal tray to keep them all together. Some of the bolts are really tight. With the last bolt removed, the frame rail can finally be lifted away. When I look at it up close, I'm really amazed how clean it is. Some of the, some of the paint is still really shiny, which is really nice. I'll touch this up and respray it before I refit it to the bike to make it mint. I remove the two front plastic covers to prevent them getting damaged when I take the engine out of the frame and then remove the spark plug caps. I then disconnect the wiring from the pulse generators and the alternator followed by the gear linkage. The gear linkage is up underneath the bike I only have to remove one bolt and slide off the block from the spline and let it hang down. Then I can remove the pivot bolt and the whole assembly comes off the bike. I'll give that a good clean up later on before I put it back together. Maybe repaint the gear lever as well. The two rear engine bolts have an adjustable spacer so you can put the engine in and then increase the width to make it fit just perfect. With the engine fully disconnected now and hanging on its two top mounting bolts, I slide some blocks of wood underneath the engine to support it so I can undo the last two bolts and it drops down onto the wood. Before I commit to taking out the two last bolts, I'd remove the plastic covers from the front of the engine to give me a bit more space because it's really tight on space. The cam drive looks mint. 
but we'll be dealing with that later. For now, let's get the engine out. So I loosen off the last two bolts, attaching the frame to the engine. With all the engine bolts removed, the engine drops down nicely onto the piece of wood and I can twist it around to the left to exit it from the frame. It's quite a tricky job and really requires a lot of pulling and shoving and pushing, but eventually I get it clear of the bike and can drag it across my floor to have a look at the engine. With the engine out and on the floor, it becomes apparent how big it is. It is so big, it's like a car engine. And I go back and look at the bike and there's a huge hole where it once was. It's just amazing really. Hello, is that David Silver Spares? It is, brilliant. Now I'm after some parts in my year 2000 Honda ST1100. I need gaskets for the engine and I need oil seals. Basically all the ones you got in stock. We well, don't normally sell that many, so they never break down. No one ever takes them apart. I know they don't take them apart normally, but I thought I'd take mine apart just to have a look inside because it's making a little noise I wasn't happy with, but I haven't found it yet, but I'm still looking. Anyway, if you could send me what you got, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Thanks, bye. I come off the phone and happen to look into the lounge and Tracy's decorating the Christmas tree. So I go in to have a quick look and it looks amazing. And there's even a valve on there from my old racing days, KX250F, made out of titanium. It's a perfect Christmas decoration. I look up at the clock and it's 10 to 11. I'd better get back out in the garage. I've got loads of cleaning to do now. I'm using a fine stainless steel wire brush to remove all the loose corrosion and oxide from the aluminium surfaces. I can then blow it off of an airline prior to stripping the engine down. The next thing I do is rotate the crankshaft until the dot on the crankshaft lines up with the raised boss on the casting and the camshafts both line up with their raised marks as well. When this is done, the engine is set in the correct position for disassembly. With the engine set in the right position, it's now safe to remove the crankshaft bolt and the tensioner followed by the belt itself. I remove the tensioner spring using a pair of pliers. The belt feels and looks absolutely amazing, like it's brand new, but I'm gonna buy a new one anyway, just to make sure, because it's not worth putting the old one back on, even if it's only done 17,000 miles. It is 20 years old. Pulleys feel absolutely lovely, really, really smooth and tight. And also the water pump journal, which is a really good thing. Otherwise I'd need to replace that as well. With the pulleys removed and the water pump securing screws removed, the water pump assembly just pulls away from the engine, disconnecting the little hose as you go. And here you can see the impeller made out of stainless steel and it rotates lovely and smooth and feels nice and firm, which is brilliant. So now I can remove the clutch cover casing. With the front of the engine stripped, I can now rotate the engine round and remove the alternator and gearbox from the back. But I can hear something going on in the utility room, so I better go and see what that is. So I open the door to have a quick look, and there's no one there, but I think it might be Tracy going out to feed the hedgehogs, so I'll just go and check. And it is, and as I go across, she's just doing the first one. She lifts the lid to have a look inside, and they've munched all the food into a mess. They sort of munch it up into powder and drunk all the water, which is quite good really, because it's really cold this time of the year and they need the food. We went around to the second feeding station and it was exactly the same, all munched away and a huge deposit as well. So we, don't, we know there's definitely been one there. Anyway, she cleans up all the mess, puts in new food and then we're all good to go for another evening. We've got one or two resident hedgehogs in the garden and these are the little houses they live in that we've made. Back in the garage, the next thing I need to do is remove the alternator. This comes off with three bolts. It's like a car alternator and just slides off from the rear. With the alternator removed, I then loosen the five or six bolts holding the gearbox to the engine and pull it off the back. There we go. It's as easy as that. It's a really good design, I think, that you can just pull it off the back 
as a whole unit. With the gearbox off, I can now pull out the drive shaft. This has got a primary damper on it as well. I then turn the engine upside down and remove the oil pump drive sprocket and chain, followed by the oil pump itself. The oil pump's quite large, but it's actually two pumps in one, which I'll be showing you later when we strip it down to have a look inside. But for now, I'm going to loosen up all the main bearing caps so I can split the crankcase. The crankcase just lifts off nicely. Everything looks really clean inside, and the main journals look mint. But we'll come back to the crankshaft later and I'll have a look at it. But for now, I want to clean off all the gold jointing gasket sealer. Honda put on just the very smallest amount of silicon based gasket sealer and it scrapes off easily. Well, that's cleaned up really, really nice. But the other places where they use gaskets are self impregnated with gasket sealer and they're really stuck on like concrete. So I have to tip the engine over, plug the holes where the water jackets go so they don't get bits in there. I don't want it. I'm going to need a sharp standy blade to cut off the old bits of gasket paper and clean up the surfaces with my firing wire brush. This takes quite a long time and you have to be persistent. You don't want to scratch the metal from the surface. You've got to sort of cut underneath the gasket to cut it off. But once it's cleaned up with a wire brush, it looks really nice. So that'll be ready for reassembly. With the front surface is clean, I'll give it a blow off of an airline and I can turn it over and look at the back surface. This is much better. The gearbox joint has barely got any sealer on it at all. It just scrapes up very, very easily. A quick wipe with a rag and it's good to go. So now I can concentrate on the lower sump casing. This has got these green gasket remnants on all the surfaces, top, bottom and ends. It takes me quite a considerable amount of time to clean it off. You've got to just persevere, do a little bit at a time, have a cup of tea, come back and carry on. Eventually it'll be like new and you can clean it all off with some cleaner, blow it through with an airline and that's ready to go back together. I like to clean parts up as I'm going along when I'm working on an engine. That way it's not one big onerous task at the end cleaning everything up. There's so many gasket surfaces on these Honda engines to clean, so doing it a bit at a time certainly breaks it up. So now I'm going to clean the clutch casing as well. This is the front cover for the engine. It should be buffed up shiny, which it never is on the pan because you can't really get to them with the covers on. So I'll rub it down first of all with some sort of 600 grade wet and dry to get all the marks out of it the best I can. Then I'm going to take it up into my shed and buff it up on my vintage buffing machine. That's better. I'm really pleased with that. It's not perfect because it was quite pitted, but it's a lot better than it was and it certainly looked nice on the bike. The next thing I'm going to do is strip the gearbox down because I want to have a look at the gears. Because when I was riding the bike, I noticed a very slight whine in fourth, which my green bike doesn't do. So I want to inspect all the gears and see what I need to do about that. Maybe change the cluster for a different one. The gearbox is really easy to disassemble. You just have to loosen several big bolts, pull them out, then the cover slides off and you can pull out the selectors and the gears themselves. I always put the washers back on the shafts so I don't forget where they go. So that's the selector shaft pulled out, pivot shaft, then the selectors come out. You have to take out the gears and the selectors together and then reassemble them on the bench. Quick visual inspection shows no obvious defects. All the gears look mint. The, first, the drive gear at the end, which is fifth gear output, has got a black sort of car hardening process on it, which is standard, and all the other gears are clear. But there's no damage to the dogs or engagement parts, and the teeth look actually quite good. But I'll clean everything off thoroughly and have a microscopic examination later on. The next thing I'm interested to look at is the oil pump. So I put it on a piece of fresh card to disassemble nicely. 
pull off the screen and the actual pickup point, the first thing I notice is that the rubber seal hasn't been fitted correctly. And this was done at Honda in Japan, because it hasn't been a part before this bike. The actual seal has been kinked as it was pushed in, and it's half down the outside of the oil pump, and half down the inside. So it would actually create an air gap, which could cause some problems with oil suction in certain conditions. So that may be some root cause of my problem, but I won't know until I further look at the big ends in the next episode. But for now, let's take the oil pump apart and just check the clearances to make sure it's okay. As I said earlier, this is a two-stage oil pump. There's a scavenge pump that sucks oil out of the clutch cavity and pumps it back into the crankcase. Then there's the main oil pump that pumps it around the engine at about 70 PSI at 3000 RPM. With all the screws removed, the oil pump pulls apart from the front, revealing the scavenge pump, which is a thin trachoidal pump. And then a secondary casing pulls off to, re to reveal the secondary part of the pump, which is much wider, so it pumps a greater volume, and that's also a trachoidal pump. Initial indications are it looks in mint condition. So what I'll do is check the actual clearances between the veins with the feeler gauges, and this, this should be within a specified limit. I checked the clearance in all four positions with a feeler gauge, and it's exactly right in the middle of the specification, so I'm really pleased about that. That means it's a good pump and should, should produce good pressure. So the next thing I'm going to do is check the pressure release valve to make sure that's not leaking. To gain access to that, you use some circlip pliers to remove the circlip, followed by a washer and a spring, and there's a long shiny plunger that pulls out. The plunger is a nice snug fit in the bore and is really shiny with no scratches and looks in mint condition, so that's good. So I have a little look around the pump for any obvious signs of wear and there's none. So I'm really happy this is a good pump. So I'll pop it back together for now so I don't lose the parts and give that a thorough clean later on and then rebuild it and it should be really nice. And here you can see how the pressure release valve works. As the oil pressure increases, the piston gets forced up, allowing the oil to flow through the hole back into the sump. Then the spring returns it back down again. This cycle repeats, maintaining the pressure. With the oil pump in appearing to be in perfect condition, I can now put it back together. So I reassemble the pressure release valve, putting in the spring washer and circlip until it snaps into its groove and double check that it's in its groove, which it is, so I'm really pleased with that. And then I can just reassemble the pump as it came apart and put in the screws. As I assemble the pump, I have to rotate the parts around to get the screw holes to line up and then replace the two location dowels. This holds it all in the correct orientation. A quick check to see if it rotates okay, and it does. It feels just nice. So now I can put in the screws to hold it all together. And when the screws are damped tight, I'll pour some oil into it just to double check that it's all working okay. And we should see the oil flow from the input to the output holes. I pour some oil into the input hole until it's flush with the top and pick up the pump and rotate the shaft and see, uh, see if the oil flows to the next port. The pump feels really nice, you can feel it's doing some work and all of a sudden the oil bubbles up to the other side and overflows, so that shows it's all working really well. Well that's about as far as we can go for this episode, but in the next episode, we, once all the parts have arrived, we should be able to get the engine back together and I'm really looking forward to that.